I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, the Living Memorial to the Holocaust. And on behalf of the museum, it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion. We're here to discuss Love It Was Not, a powerful new film from Israeli director Maya Sarfati and Austrian-Israeli producing team Mir Saar and Kurt Langbein. Hopefully you all had a chance to watch the film in advance of today's discussion. If you didn't, it will remain available for another 24 hours at the link in the Zoom chat, and we hope that you do. All of us at the museum are grateful and delighted to be co-presenting the film and discussion with our partners at the Austrian Cultural Forum and the Office of Cultural Affairs at the Consulate General of Israel in New York, who you'll hear from in just a moment. And we're also grateful to Greenwich Entertainment for uh, helping to facilitate uh, the screening and discussion. Today's discussion will include Maya and Kurt and it will be facilitated by Dr. Annette Insdorf, who is a professor of film at Columbia University's School of the Arts and a moderator of the popular Real Pieces series at Manhattan's 92Y, where she's interviewed almost 300 film celebrities. The daughter of Holocaust survivors, Net is the author of the landmark study Indelible Shadows, Film and the Holocaust, Double Lives, Second Chances, The Cinema of Kirstoff Kieslowski, Francois Truffaut, A Study of the French Director's Work, Philip, Philip Kaufman, and Intimations, The Cinema of Wojciech Haas. Her latest book is Cinematic Overtures, How to Read Opening Scenes, currently in its fourth printing. Uh, Annette will kick off the discussion in a moment, but before she does, let's hear from our partners at the Austrian Cultural Forum and the, Israel, uh, the Office of Cultural Affairs at the Consulate General of Israel in New York. Thank you all for being here. And um, one more thing, please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box throughout the discussion, and we'll get to as many as we can during a short period at the end. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Consulate General of Israel in New York, it is an honor for me to take part in this important event. I would like to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage for many years of fruitful partnership and especially the successful events with which we have during COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks to Ari Goldstein, who led the project from their side. Thank you, Michael Heider, from the Austrian Cultural Forum for your willingness to present this project together. We appreciate the opportunity to work together and build a relationship in hopes of further collaborations. Thanks to Annette Instorf from Columbia University for taking part in this event and for your continued support and involvement in Israeli cinema. Thanks to Greenwich Entertainment and Oded Horowitz for the collaboration that allows us to present this film. And last but not least, I want to thank Daniel Zeus, our creative and dedicated director of film and television for his hard work that made this event happen. My late mother, Eva Chava Hirsch, was born in Vienna in 1927 to a Jewish assimilated family. She spent her formative years in Ghetto Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, and a labor camp for women in Germany. For many years, I failed to convince her to tell me more about her experiences and how she survived the Holocaust. So I surely understand how difficult it was for the survivors to tell the story as it is for us to understand. The movie Love It Was Not is about recounting and sharing. It's about telling a love story, not like the ones from Hollywood productions, but the ones from depth of hell from Auschwitz. Through the love, the story between Helena Citron and Franz Wunsch in a place where humanity was extinct, we can learn more and something about ourselves as human beings. During difficult days for us in Israel, films of this kind, carefully constructed from meticulous research work and exceptional artistic means, allow for a complex look at moral issues. And we believe that art is the best medium to transmit this vital message. It's an honor to be involved in one of the first US screening of this important film directed by Maya Safati and produced by Kurt Langwin and Nir Sao. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lonnie. Uh, it is <clears throat> on behalf of the Austrian Cultural Forum here in New York 
a great honor and uh, a privilege to uh, be able to participate in that project. And uh, therefore my great thanks uh, to the Israeli Consulate General and to the Museum of Jew Jewish Heritage to make this possible. Uh, I'm a historian by myself and I have to admit when I saw the movie for the first time, uh, it was same as incredible uh, and uh, as astonishing because it might help uh, for a better understanding, not only uh, what survivors experienced uh, during the Holocaust, but especially what they experienced afterwards and what their children had to experience. And uh, the sad part of the message is that uh, with the liberation in 1945, it was far from being over. When we started that project, uh, and uh, I'm happy that we are today at this discussion, uh, we couldn't foresee that uh, today survivors and their uh, children in Israel are facing day by day a terrible threat by rockets. And uh, I can assure you Austria's solidarity. Uh, thank you, Maya. Safati uh, and Kurt Langbein for your amazing work. Uh, thank you, Annette, for uh, sharing now this discussion. I'm looking forward. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, I'm honored and delighted to be part of this event because I found Love It Was Not to be such a fascinating documentary about a surprising love story. I've not really heard about a Jewish Auschwitz prisoner like Helena and an SS officer like Franz Wunsch being able to connect in a place like Auschwitz. I congratulate Maya Sarfati for a bold approach because what made the film really work for me is the self-conscious style of those cutouts. Together with interviews, you reconstruct a fragmented past in which prisoners' minds and bodies were not necessarily in harmony. Could you tell us how you chose this unique style of photomontage? Good evening, Anne. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us, finding the time. Uh, thank you for the audience to, to be here with us, listening to us and everybody else, of course. Um, well, uh, when we came, we first came to, to, to work on this film, to start working on this film, uh, the first challenge we had uh, is the same challenge that every filmmaker that makes a documentary about the Holocaust is facing, which is the lack of footage. Uh, we have a very a small amount of footage from Auschwitz uh, when the Americans and the Russians came to uh, close to Auschwitz. Uh, the Germans uh, burned it all, burned it all. Uh, the estimation that only 5% of the material uh, survived. And this 5% we know very, very good. Uh, and it's hard to say, it's even a bit of sad to say, but it's, it's worn out. We know these pictures, they don't move us. They don't, um, um, makes us feel uh, it's black and white, it's old, the piles of, of the shoes, of the clothes. So, and uh, the other thing is that um, my three protagonists are, are not alive. Uh, I can't film them. I can't bring them together. I can take them to places what uh, any documentary filmmaker wants to do. So I don't have, the means to tell the story. Uh, so we started looking for uh, our uh, cinematic uh, approach. Uh, and, and it actually was like in the movies. Uh, I, I woke up uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, Nir Saar, the Israeli producer, is also my husband. So he was just next to me. <laughs> and I woke up and told him, I have it. I have it. The answer is within the story. Uh, I don't have to, to, to do anything else, just to work with, uh, with, the, with the elements in the story. Because Franz Wunsch, for the most of his life, 
made these photo montages of Helena. He placed her in different clothing and different, different backgrounds. I, I believe it, it was a way for him to imagine an alternative life in which they could have had been together. Uh, a bit of naive, I would say. Uh, but Franz did it in order to see the pictures he wanted to see. And I borrowed and developed the technique in order to see the pictures I wanted to see. Uh, we looked uh, all over the world, literally all over the world for the artists to work with. We looked in America, in Austria, obviously, in Spain, in um, Poland, and of course, obviously, uh, eventually uh, I worked with two wonderful artists, Israeli artists, neighbors almost, <laughs> uh, here in Tel Aviv. Ayelet uh, Albenda and Shlomit Gofer. Uh, we worked with real archival photos from the period, from the war and the camps. And we made this kind of 3D multi-layered photo montage, you can say. Uh, it was all handmade and shot in a studio. Well, not, not exactly all. I will show you some uh, behind the scenes uh, photos. Mm -hmm. So it will help us to understand. Uh, in the first stage, Ayala took uh, all, uh, all the ma archival materials and made this uh, two dim dimension digital uh, illustrations of the scenes we wanted to, uh, uh, to have in the film. Uh, in the second stage, Shlomit took, took the, the pictures and uh, uh, broke it to, to the layers. We called it two and a half Ds because uh, every dimension was still a paper cut, but they were uh, placed uh, uh, in, 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 uh, on the maquette. Uh, you, as you can see here, maquette, a small model of, uh, of stage. And then we took it into the studio and uh, there we, um, shot it, uh, shot all the scenes, the camera wo uh, uh, was between the layers, over the layers, under the layers, <laughs> uh, almost every, every possible way. Uh, we had, uh, uh, and that the way the, the cutouts was, the cutout was made. It was very important to me that it will be very uh, uh, clear to the audience when they are looking on a real archival footage, because we do have pictures from uh, Auschwitz, and when they are looking at uh, illustration, uh, an imaginary illustration of my imagination, we, we worked with the uh, historical facts and we based our illustrations on, on the women's testimonies, but it's still the way I imagined it. I, I'm not sure this is how it was, even though I must say I got uh, very good reactions from survivors that it felt that it feels and felt uh, uh, quite um, accurate uh, for them. It felt quite accurate for them. Um, so this handmade uh, style, the rough, uh, cut, the rough uh, cutting of the paper uh, is for the audience uh, to be able to distinguish ben, between uh, imaginary illustration and uh, real archival footage. Uh, it works beautifully. And I must say, what a surprise it was to see the daughter, Dagmar, saying about the photo that her father was the SS officer who took it. And she says she was the love of his life. He took the head off and put it on different clothes. So that line not only validates your approach, but I, I love the way that the layers of the what really happened and of your approach came together. It's a wonderful example of how, as they say, the limitations define the possibilities. You don't exactly. have archival footage. You create something even more visually dramatic and enticing. Could you also tell us, before I get to Kurt Langbein, um, 
how this project originated. What was it that first drew you to the story of Helena Citron? How did you find out about it? Uh, well, uh, I believe I was only seven or eight when I first heard the story. Uh, Mickey Marin, she's Rosa's daughter. Uh, she was my first acting teacher when I was just a little child. Uh, she entrusted the story into my hands. Uh, I actually tried to tell it in many forms and all kind of mediums uh, along the years, but it never felt right. It never felt um, accurate. Uh, till five years ago, Mickey and I contacted Dagmar, the SS officer's daughter, and when we learned that she's very open and willing to talk and to cooperate, and when she gave me his diaries and home videos, when I, 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 I the first time, Annette, the first time I opened my <laughs> laptop, laptop and found uh, uh, in my email uh, this uh, SS officer's testimony, Franz Wunsch sitting in his backyard in his short shorts, talking freely um, about uh, his past, about, about Mengele. Uh, uh, I, realized, I realized that I have a, a unique access uh, to this story. Uh, and I believe that was the point in which I realized I finally have the means to tell the full and complete story of Elena, Franz and Rosa. Uh, and we started working on it. Okay. <laughs> now for Kurt Langbein, you are the son of Hermann Langbein, who was a non-Jewish resistance fighter and Auschwitz survivor. And along with Simon Wiesenthal, he led the struggle to bring to trial Austrian SS who served in the camps, including Franz Wunsch. At what point did you get involved in this film? Well, it was, I think, in 2017. It was a rather early stage, I think. Uh, and uh, at first, Maya contacted me because I'm the son of Hermann Langbein for research. And then she learned to know that I'm also a, a film producer. So it came step by step. Uh, I, I came involved in, in the project and it was really very fascinating from the beginning. You know, my father did a lot of uh, historic and psychologic and social work about Auschwitz and the SS uh, on a very high level. But this approach to, to give all the young persons also the possibility to feel how it was and to feel all the, the first in, inside all the persons, this was very fascinating for me. And, you know, something, sometimes you simply get a feeling, yes, this will work. The, the, the whole project was at the beginning, the whole creative process was uh, before us. Uh, Maya didn't wake up in, in those days, only some days later and mm -hmm. with her basic idea but I was full of trust that this will be a marvelous event and that's how it was. Okay, and I'm, I'm very aware of your end titles where it, you write Wiesenthal and Hermann Langbein alerted authorities in the 1960s that mm -hmm. 70 former SS officers were leaving, living freely around them, mm -hmm. only four faced trial, mm -hmm. all were acquitted. That's a rather sobering conclusion to an otherwise uh, aesthetically, certainly uplifting motion picture. But obviously we have to end with the note of reality. I guess that's how you felt. Yes, correct. Uh, uh, the German side was a little bit more strict and uh, uh, my father succeeded in, in the Frankfurter Auschwitz process. Uh, there were there were some sentences, uh, but Austria was in 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 that way. But I think the, the these stories are told, and and it's uh, it's terrible enough that they have to be told more and more, in, even in the future. But to get really emotional contact, you have to tell 
different stories and that's the way Maya uh, went and I'm very happy to be part of this team. With good reason. I want to ask Maya about your research because obviously to be a documentary filmmaker means not only that you have to find the right cinematic language to tell the story, you also have to take a tremendous amount of historical material and refine it into a dramatic focus. So I gather you did research in a number of countries. Could you talk a little about that process? Yes. Uh, well, uh, the, the research in uh, Vienna uh, was, uh, was made by uh, Brigitte Ambelmeier. Uh, she did all the, the, the research regarding the trial. Uh, it was wonderful working with her. Uh, it helped a lot because when I tried to do it in English, writing uh, emails, I got no answer. And she was wonderful, and she uh, and she worked hard. And I think we uh, we see the uh, the results in the film. Uh, the 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 main uh, issue for me was um, that, as I said, my three protagonists are not alive. Uh, anymore. So the first thing I realized that I have to, to find other survivors that were there and can remember and can tell me uh, and answer my questions. Uh, so uh, I spent 2016 and most of 2017 at Yad Vashem archive in Jerusalem looking for testimonies of women, survi women survivors uh, were among the first transports to Auschwitz or worked in the Canada facilities or both. I think I watched dozens, dozens of testimonies on it, really. Uh, it was, it was terrible, terrible period for me. A miserable days. Uh, I, I can tell you I cried more than usual back then. Um, and I, and, and I watched these testim testimonies hoping that they would remember and mention the story of Elena and Franz and Rosa. Uh, and to my surprise, uh, there were, uh, uh, be, as I said, it was a terrible period and, and lots of crying, uh, but there were also moments of light, uh, at least from a scriptwriter point of view. Because uh, quite a few of the survivors devoted precious minutes of their personal testimonies, personal uh, life story, to this story. And those few minutes were a kind of a window, you know, uh, through it I, I could peek into, into the past. And the word helped me understand what is the real day-to-day -day meaning of the bombastic headline an affair between an SS officer and a Jewish prisoner in Auschwitz. You know, they, they gave it color. Uh, they made me understand what does it look like and sound like and feel like and what they thought and feel, uh, felt about it. Uh, I was able to locate seven of the women and interview them myself. Uh, two of them are no longer alive by now and they haven't seen the film, the other did. And I'm happy to say they liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the testimonies in the film are the product of the important and very valuable efforts uh, of Yad Vashem and the Shoah Foundation by Steve Spielberg. Uh, I must give the full credit uh, to this project, important projects. Um, I call these brave and beautiful women in the film the chorus of the thousand women. And for me, all of them together, together are the fourth, fourth protagonist of the film. There is Elena, Rosa, Franz, and the woman's chorus. Mm. Uh, as in the classical Greek tragedy, the, cor the chorus accompanies, accompanies and unfolds the story. Uh, but there is a one big difference. Here in, in our film, the chorus does not speak in one voice. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, each and every one of these, uh, of these women 
bring a different voice and a different gaze at Elena and the whole story. Mm-hmm. And I love them. I love each and every one of these women. They are brave, they are honest, they are nasty, they are full of envy, they are wonderfully human and fearlessly honest. And they look straight into the camera and speak from the bottom of their heart. Uh, and I, I truly adore each and every one of them. And what is wonderful as well, they have terrific memories. <laughs> they seem to have no sort of mental blocks about the past. But uh, there's another very fascinating aspect uh, in, in this film. This is remembrance and truth. You know, in the trials, uh, it was always a big problem that, of course, our brain doesn't work so that uh, uh, 30 years after this, uh, an event, we can remember every detail. But uh, this chorus uh, tells us that our brain is working very differently, even if it is very honest. And they are telling the same story, even although these stories they are telling are very different. <laughs> so that's for me a very fascinating aspect to see it. And, and also that's a big uh, uh, success of the film to be able to, to tell this without any condemn, condemnation and without any, any trial and any different things. So. I understand that. I have a question, and it's also being echoed in some of the questions I'm seeing from the Q&A box. Did your feelings about Helena or Franz change in the making of the film? Because, for example, Helena is interviewed decades later. She's still so attractive with the red lipstick, the dark hair pulled back her skin taut like from plastic surgery. And she's very candid about survival and admitting that when the prisoners knew the barracks were exploding, they would let their friends be where the buildings came down. And yet she could also say, I saved many people thanks to him. So just curious, first for Maya and then for Kurt, did your feelings change? Well, um, I'm not sure if, if uh, my feeling changed uh, along uh, uh, the process of making the film, but I, I can say that the th- the thing that most fascinated me uh, from the first mi- for from the first minute in the story was the ambivalence of the two main figures, uh, the SS officer and the Jewish victim, because uh, you can't really speak about Franz as pure evil. He was a sadistic SS officer in Auschwitz. There is no argue about that. He bet men and women uh, harshly. <clears throat> and after uh, all the um, research about the trial, I'm quite sure he took part in the selection. One moment, sorry. <clears throat> so, thank you. Uh, so there is no uh, argue about uh, France being a sadistic SS officer. But at the same time, he also was quite romantic and tender man that is capable of pure love and compassion. And Elena is not, is also not the classic imaginary victim. She's a strong woman with a strong survival drive, willing to do whatever she needs in order to save herself and to save her sister. So these gray zones between evil and pure, between good and bad, these are the areas that drives me as a storyteller. And this is what one of the things that makes this uh, story so important and so relevant uh, to our lives today. It's not only an historical, unbelievable story that happened someday before. Uh, the ambivalence of the two, the, the two uh, characters, the understanding that the good and the bad are uh, lying side by side, uh, that, that are, uh, they are not, um, um, I'm not sure this is the right <laughs> word in English, but they're not uh, 
demolishing each other. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Annette. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very important uh, point in the story for me. Uh, yeah. And Kurt? To me, it's a little bit similar. But, you know, on the one hand, I learned from my father's work that, and, and from him, of course, personally, that uh, the SS men who are the biggest murderer ever uh, are not uh, beasts. They are simply persons like we, like we are. And they have, of course, emotions and all the things. And only because they are, they decided to, to uh, work in a system where an order has to be followed and nothing else made them to, to that. Uh, of course, racism plays a big role. So that was not very, very surprising. But for me, it was fascinating, the openness of Helena after, after the war and the openness, uh, how she, she faced this very ambivalent situation mm -hmm. and her role and uh, this, uh, even I, I liked her more after after the film than before, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing is that uh, it's also, I think a little bit incredible, but we have to have it in mind that uh, we, as we found one of the jury members, uh, his impressions were so crazy. I think as, as the, impressions of Franz Wunsch at the end of Auschwitz was he, he, he mentioned oh it's such a pity if we, we, if we had won the war it would be much better for our love and the, you think hey <laughs> what's going on in his, in his head yeah? so people are driven by such emotions in a very very crazy way and, uh, but it's good to learn this yeah Right, I think your film raises some important questions. Look, that Franz Wunsch was acquitted is one story, it's factual. Yeah. That it is harder, at least for me, to judge this Nazi than others provides the film's complexity. Should we rationalize his guilt because he saved at least Helena, Ruja, or should we critique him because it was romantic love mm -hmm. that led to his risk-taking activity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are no easy answers. And let me throw in one other thing. If I understood correctly, he was 20 years old at the time. Is yeah. that correct? And I mean, 20 years old and, and a guard in Auschwitz, do we cut more slack for somebody in that age range than older? Might be, but I can I can say uh, that Franz Wunsch never uh, expressed any regret uh, no. uh, uh, in his life. Uh, as as Kurt mentioned, the 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 phrasing, "If we only had won the war," uh, so more than anything, I think. And also, we 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 have to remember. He wasn't uh, righteous among the nations, yeah? He saved Helena because he loved her and he saved her sister. He didn't save Jews because he, he thought what, is, what happens around him is terrible and should be stopped. Uh, he loved her and he was willing to risk his life for her. Uh, and there's a big difference. Uh, and he helped all, people that she asked him to help. Uh, over the mark here it's a, it's a very big difference yes, uh, I do as agree. i see it he was old enough to kill thousands uh, as every of his colleagues or comrades so uh, it's you have to face that if people in the war are, are even 18 they they have to to be responsible for, for what what they are doing so okay now, um, I'm going to ask uh, Maya, about four years ago, you won the Student Academy Award for Best Foreign Documentary 
for the short version of this story. It was 32 minutes and it was called The Most Beautiful Woman. How did you change or expand 32 minutes into 86? In other words, I haven't seen your original short. How much of what we have in the fiction feature, in the documentary feature rather, comes directly from the short and how much was added later? Nothing. It's, it's a completely different <laughs> film. Uh, it's truly, it truly is. Because um, the, the, the short film, uh, uh, one moment, please. The short film, The Most Beautiful Woman, uh, is uh, fo uh, focus, focus on the second generation rather the, than the historical story as, as uh, love it was not. Uh, and uh, in, in The Most Beautiful Woman, I tell the story uh, very shortly. And then the main event, the main scene of the film uh, is a, a meeting between Dagmar, uh, Franz's daughter, and the children of the survivors, Helena and Rosa. And Rosa. I brought Dagmar to Israel uh, and one moment, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, it was a very, very dramatic and intensive meeting, meeting Annette, as much as you imagine, then take it five steps farther. Uh, there was a big gap, uh, uh, especially when Dagma, uh, between Dagma and Mickey, uh, she's Rosa's daughter. Uh, uh, you've seen it, seen her in the film, because Miki, she she actually lost her to uh, her sister and her baby brother uh, in in Auschwitz, uh, and there was a big gap uh, between th th these two uh, women, uh, Dagmar and Miki, uh, and it was very intensive and very emotional, uh, and this is the core. Of the of the short film, um, uh, here you can see everyone: Israel and Billy, the the children of Rosa. This is Paul, uh, Dagmar's uh, husband, and this is Mickey, Dagmar, and this is me here. And uh, this is some pictures from the Academy Award. Uh, student Academy Award cinema, uh, uh, ceremony. This is me, short and very colorful, colorful <laughs> among the black tall people. Um, one moment, I will find how I'm stop sharing. Here we are back again. <laughs> By the way, I just had a, a momentary treat because one of the students winning, he was two away from you my former student, Jimmy K. Ruse. I ah. guess he won the same year for, broke, uh, for Nocturne in Black mm -hmm. or for the fiction. Yeah, I, that, that was a film that I loved as a short. And he also expanded it into a feature called yeah. Broken Keys, which was the Lebanese entry for the foreign language film Oscar a few months ago. <laughs> Small world. Um, now, Dean Forward, I'm jumping to one of the questions in the, in the Q&A because it's related. Would you consider making a fiction version of this story? Classical question. <laughs> um, as I said in, in, in the start of our conversation, I, uh, I tried to, 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 to tell this story in many, in many forms. And one of them was that I tried to write it first I, 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 write, I, I tried to write it as a fiction uh, screenplay and I failed because uh, the story is so big and so unbelievable that my words felt so small and not realistic and it all, always felt so, what is it? Uh, but the uh, the fact that I failed to do it doesn't mean that someone else can't make it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Uh, what what will be will be. <laughs> yeah, I think you can direct it. Yeah. 
Maybe. <laughs> but it would probably have to, again, be as different from the documentary as the feature documentary was from the short. One yes. has to find another, shall we say, fictional entry point in order for it to live as a dramatic arc sort of film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and in terms of the way this was made, Love It Was Not, for Kurt, how is the film a co-production of Israel and Austria? I mean, apart from your identity as an Austrian and, and near uh, Asar being Israeli, was it a question of the funds or something more? I believe it was something more. It was uh, a, a form of cooperation between persons who are very personally involved in, in, in uh, the topic and in the questions risen by that. And uh, it was not uh, just by chance that we found each other and uh, for me, it was uh, much more. And and then I know you know I'm I'm in 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 the film business for several weeks. Let's say uh, I never made an experience of such an open and direct and fair co-production. It, it was really amazing, fine for me. Yeah? Yeah, and I know that you're also a director of documentaries, not just a yes. producer. I, yes. I took a look at your filmography and the title that struck me was uh, Elvis und das Mädchen aus Wien from 2017. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I was wondering whether, therefore, your role as producer included directorial suggestions. For example, did you watch some of the film in process and make suggestions about what Maya was doing? Uh, only to a very small extent. I think my, my experience as a director helped me to trust Maya because I, I got the feeling that she's thinking in a, and, and associating in a very, very marvelous way. So that helps me to trust. Uh, it was not really interference. Well, I, 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 well, I can say it was a, a great experience working with the court uh, and I felt a great confidence, even when uh, I got uh, bad reactions along the way, uh, uh, with uh, showing cuts and people that didn't get my vision because it was in, in stages uh, making the, uh, at some point, half of the film was blacks uh, till the, we, all the cutouts with, uh, were filmed mm -hmm. uh, and, and Kurt really helped me believe in my vision and uh, to believe in myself and to go forward with my vision. Good. Um, I have gotten a few questions in the Q&A box that revolve around one particular issue. So I'm going to go, Carrie and Barbara and Melissa are all asking a similar question. Did Helena and Roja reconcile after the war? Did Roja forgive Helena? Well, I think uh, the sister, well, she never, I will start with the end, at, in the end, with the end. She never forgave her. She never took the curse off, never, still, they were very, very close, close for all their lives. Uh, they were uh, loving and caring sisters. Uh, this ambivalence uh, that I talked about before is also uh, uh, relevant to the sisters' relationships. Uh, their, their children were good friends uh, for all their lives. Uh, they spent uh, Shabbatot, Sabbath, and uh, Fridays evening together uh, and holidays, and they were very close. And at the same time, uh, the wound never healed. Um, we've been asked, is it possible to see the short film, The Most uh, Beautiful Woman? Is that available? Yes, of course. I will send Ari uh, a link uh, to Vimeo and uh, uh, he will, I, I, I will talk to him and see how we can uh, uh, manage that, yeah. Great. Um, then let's see, among the interesting questions, 
which female singer what did we hear singing Liba Varesni? Is, is it possibly the same singer that one hears in Babylon, Berlin? Uh, well, actually, the singer uh, is one of the artists that made the cutouts. Her name is Ayelet. She's a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, she learned uh, in Berlin for nine years. She le learned arts in, uh, in Berlin. And uh, while we worked, uh, uh, while I worked with Sharon Yehi, she's my editor, well, my wonderful editor. Uh, when we worked, we needed a, a guide uh, to edit. So I, I called her and I asked her, can you please uh, uh, record yourself on the iPhone for me? And she said, yes, of course, just send me the words. And I send, send, sent her the, the YouTube and she recorded it on her iPhone while her daughter is sleeping in the next room. And we loved it so much. And uh, uh, Paul Gallister, uh, our uh, Austrian uh, mu musician, loved it as well. And I asked, do you think we should uh, record a, a professional singer? And said, no, no, she's wonderful. And I actually took her to a studio to, to have a good re uh, record on, to this song. And eventually, we worked with this iPhone uh, recording. Because uh, there was something so emotional and so um, honest and um, um, exposed, emotionally exposed in her voice, uh, something about uh, her being alone in her living room, I think. Uh, and we used it. Uh, we just used it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, I think it was Nat who asked about, was Helena too harsh after the war vis-a-vis -vis Franz not answering his letters? Um, he actually quoted the line, who saves one person saves the world, which is endemic to the Jewish tradition. How do you feel about that? If she was too harsh? Um... In other words, if indeed, she owed him her life. Let's just use that as a point of departure. Then her not answering his letters, her not looking at him at the trial. Did you feel that that was justified? Well, let's look at, um, uh, look, look at what was it like for her after the war? Because uh, the atmosphere in the Israeli uh, street back then in the late 40s, uh, start of the 50s, uh, was uh, not so not so sympathetic to the survivors because the gaze on, a, on them was um, a bit of suspicious because how can it be that you survived? What have you done in order to survive? And what have you done as a woman, as a woman to survive? And now imagine yourself in, the, in this situation when you truly did have a, a relationship with an SS officer, officer back there. So uh, not only Elena, but none, uh, most of the survivors uh, haven't spoke about what happened there uh, for years. It was silence, mm. uh, silenced. Um, only in the 60s, uh, in the Eichmann trial, there was the big change and uh, uh, survivors started uh, talking about what happened there, the the uh, the family myth uh, is that Helena sat with the the radio, listening to the Eichmann trial, and at some point uh, she collapsed and cried and lost her voice, and from that moment she never sang again. Mm. Uh, but she never sang, but she started talking, and she started telling her story, only in the sixties. Uh, and I can say that I uh, watched and listened to several uh, testimonies of Helena uh, along the years. And the first testimony is from uh, the early 80s, uh, from Yad Vashem. Uh, Gidon Greif is, uh, Professor Gidon Greif is doing the interview and she's telling her story. And at some point Gidon is asking her about why this, this SS officer saved your sister? 
and she stops the interview and she she can't answer him and when and when he ask she can barely say the name Franz Wunsch in the Spielberg uh, archive testimony she already tells the whole story fluently and in uh, uh, even uh, later uh, uh, interview she can say I I had feelings for him hmm. uh, so I think that the process along the years of uh, the environment around her and also uh, for her personally uh, uh, evolved and changed along the years and uh, no I don't think she was harsh I need she, I think she did whatever she needed to do in order to survive in the war and after the war thank you that's a very comprehensive answer uh, two overlapping questions uh, Liz Harris was asking did you do you think that they had a physical relationship and Ken was asking did Helena really love France or was this merely so that she could survive that she you know engaged in this relationship Regarding the physical uh, relationship, I can only say that both of them, Elena and Franz, uh, 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 say uh, in their testimony that there, wa there, there wasn't any physical contact. Uh, I never, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't dealt with this question in the film because I felt I don't have the means, I don't have them to sit and to ask them uh, the full answer, so it will be only um, yellowish gossip, uh, kind of. Uh, so I, I haven't uh, dealt with the uh, with this issue at all. Uh, I, I just put it aside. Uh, whether she loved him, ha! Huh. I'm not sure you can even speak in terms in love uh, of of love when you are talking about uh, an SS officer and a Jewish girl in Auschwitz, can you speak about free will, uh, free choice? Uh, I, I can only say that what she said, that at some point uh, she had feelings for him. Uh, I have no doubt that she was grateful uh, and thank thankful, um, but love, it was not. It was not. I can say, I can uh, uh, tell a very interesting uh, perspective, uh, to give a, a very interesting pers perspective uh, as an answer. Uh, Helena, you say, love it was not. Helena says that the, the, song, the song she sang uh, at, the, at the first meeting was Liebe war es nie. It was never love. This is the direct... Uh, the, uh, translation. She translated as love it was not, and I'm going with her trans translation. Franz Wunsch in his diaries uh, tells that the, the song she sang, uh, I, I don't know the words in uh, German, I'm sorry, Kurt, forgive me. I, on, I only know the translation, and the translation is, my heart is homesick for your love. So Elena, love it was not, and Franz my heart is homesick for your love. If you ask me, neither of the song, songs was the song that really, <laughs> uh, she really sang there, but I think that what uh, each, of, and ev each of them uh, choose to tell or choose to remember tells everything about their personal position regarding the, the story. And also since one of the questions raised this, I'm going back to the fact that Wunsch was 20, and I guess Helena was what, about 17? So we're, we're not talking was. about full, say, I'm sorry? 19, she was 19. Yeah. 19. So again, they are still comparatively young with unformed you know, senses of self or romance in an exceedingly limited situation. It's, it's hard, and, and I think you do not let us judge. It's very hard to say, oh, here's what I would have done or whatever. In fact, one of the questions was, was there any discussion of Stockholm syndrome 
in the mm -hmm. relationship between Helena and France? Uh, yes, uh, yes, it's something that uh, I uh, thought about, but none of the, the women survivors uh, talked about. Uh, and I, as I uh, saw it, my place, my, um, my role was only to be the stage upon uh, the, uh, the survivors and the protagonist can tell the story, their story in their own words. Uh, so I, I went with, with, with what they thought and not what I thought. Good. <laughs> I realize that we are coming close to the end of our time. And I see that there is in the Q&A box a rather significant contribution that I'd like everyone to know about. This comes from Liz Roth, who writes, not a question, but I would like to introduce myself and to thank you for bringing this amazing film to the US. I am an American cousin of Helena Citron. Mm -hmm. My great grandmother, uh, Safta Rezel Citron was a brother of Helena's father, Michael Citron. I met Shoshana and Sephora, Helena, in Israel in the 1970s when I did my gap year in Israel. My Israeli cousins have been raving about the film for the past year, and I was thrilled to finally have the opportunity to see it." Unquote. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for writing us. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that it is fantastic to do public programs of this nature is not only to celebrate a film and help its release into the wider audience, but to, to give the opportunity for individuals who have private connections to actually enter into the discussion. And, and I really was curious about one thing, Maya. Did you have any Holocaust background in your own family? No. <laughs> no, from my father's side, I'm a nine generation in Israel. Uh, uh, my mother, she's from uh, Litha, uh, Lithonia. Uh, and her family uh, um, uh, ran away before uh, the war. And I uh, must say that as a child, I, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit absurd or ironic uh, to say, but as a child, I was envy at the other children that had this brave uh, grandfather and fathers and grandmothers with this wonderful stories about the way they survived and and my family had no wonderful story just you know they were uh, i actually made a short film about that uh, about a girl without a uh, holocaust past in her uh, family uh, it's another short i did uh, but now I have, now I'm part of the Citron family uh, in many ways. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I realize that we've come to the moment that I have been told is the cutoff. So I just want to express my own um, personal gratitude to Kurt and Maya, first of all, for making this remarkable film. And second, for spending this hour with us to illuminate us about the background and the meaning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, wonderful to, to talk to you, Annette. Thank you, Kurt, for joining us. Thank you, Ari, for uh, uh, this wonderful uh, event. And uh, Bonnie and Michael and Daniel, thank you, everybody. Uh, also, Oded, uh, our, uh, that works with us in, in America. Uh, thank you. It was great being here. Thank you for the audience for watching. and listening and thank you. On behalf of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, the Austrian Cultural Forum and the Office of Cultural Affairs at the Consulate General of Israel in New York, I just echo and that's thanks to both of you, Maya and Kurt for producing this and directing this amazing film. Uh, and, and thank you, Annette, for helping all of us understand it, uh, both the making of the film and its significance. I think this has left us all with a lot to think about as we go into our lives. Um,